So I'm really, really happy to be joined today by Dr. Jennifer Haley. Um, it's so nice, Jen, to have you on the show because I've never had anyone yet come on and talk all about skin health. And it's just something that everyone cares about. It's so, so important. So first of all, really warm welcome. It's so lovely to have you here today. Thanks, Angela. I'm so happy to be here. I love uh, integrating all of this stuff together and sharing some good information with your audience and how they can incorporate it into their whole well-being, you know, which is is all the information that you always share. And I enjoy listening to your podcast all the time. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. And likewise, I love listening to yours. So um, let's let's get started by talking, first of all, I think the biggest thing that everyone who is over the age of 30 uh, begins to struggle with is skin aging um, and how they can kind of, you know, what starts as expression lines, they then start to become kind of deeper formed, don't they, if we're not taking care of our skin. And I know that you very much feel that it is an inside out job as much as anything. Um, but can we can we kind of look at both as well? So what was where's the best place to start in terms of first of all, why is our skin aging? Presumably collagen's breaking down, but it must be a bit more complex than that. Why do we start to look older? Yeah, that's a that's a great starting question. Um, so when I trained, we were pretty much told your genetics are your destiny. And now with the whole field of epigenetics, we know that not to be true, right? And about 90% of what we decide and choose in our lifestyle determines our health and our skin is an organ, just like any other organ, it's a visible organ. So it really represents what's going on deep inside the skin. And we have intrinsic factors of aging that are beyond our control, our genetics, our age, we are going to age over time. And then we have extrinsic factors, which are factors that are within our control our stress, our environment, the amount of toxins that we put into our body, because if our body is busy breaking down toxins from poor air quality, poor water quality, the foods we eat, the chemicals we ingest, you know, mold we might be exposed to, there's, there's so many different toxins we're exposed to on a daily basis, plastics. Uh, if, if we're exposed to more and more toxins, our bodies are so busy repairing and kind of trying to catch up, eliminating those toxins that what happens is, is it's unable to repair and renew our skin as it did when we were younger and those toxins accumulate over time. Um, and then UV light, ultraviolet light, which I live in Arizona. I have a lot of that compared to you in England, you know, so we have, um, ultraviolet light, which is radiation. A lot of people don't think of UV radiation radiation is actual radiation hitting the skin is a really big cause of extrinsic aging. And um, one of the things that we try to minimize in what I call the high real estate areas, because I do like sun exposure. I think sun exposure is important for vitamin D and for the human photosynthesis that we do. But in the long run, when people are exposed every day for on a chronic basis, it reduces the immune system in the area, predisposes to skin cancers, causes deep collagen breakdown of the skin, lots of discoloration of brown spots, white spots, dis, you know, dispigmentation and mottled pigmentation. And uh, it's not really worth it in those areas. So um, those are the big causes of extrinsic aging, as well as sugar. Sugar causes AGEs in the skin, advanced glycation end products, which basically bind to um, all the proteins in our body from the joints to the collagen in our skin. And what causes that supple kind of dewy glow in a young person, and then we get kind of sallow and saggy as we we get older is the loss of the structure of the collagen from all of these causes of the breakdown. So, you know, once you're able to identify and clear what you have control of in your body, you know, in your environment, like, do you smoke? Stop smoking. Do you live mm -hmm. in a city where there's a lot of pollution? You know, try to have air purifiers in your home that can make a big difference. Um, add in some antioxidants, both topically and internally. And supplements can help with that. Eliminating those things can help with that. And it can slow down the aging process to the point where when you're 50, your skin can actually look like you're 30 if you are modifying your lifestyle in these small little incremental ways. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And so I guess just to touch on the sunscreen aspect, first of all, because people have different opinions on this, right? Some people I've been told, even in the UK, I've been told by dermatologists, you've got to wear sun protection year round, 365 days a year, even in your car, because you could be, and obviously makeup contains, even mineral makeup has a natural sun protection. 
Do we need to do that year round? And if so, how high do we need to go? And do we need to worry about a chemical sunscreen versus one that's basically sort of reflective? What, what's your views on that? Mm-hmm. So this can get complicated because marketing always kind of mm. throws things off, especially in the United States. You know, there's a lot of marketing uh, claims that aren't very accurate and they don't tell the whole picture. And I know regulations are quite different. You, your country is a uh, little bit better about regulating chemicals. I have always been an advocate of avoiding chemicals. So what I recommend is an SPF 30 or higher, 30 blocks about 99% of the UV light every day. And I want it to contain zinc oxide and or best if it's both titanium dioxide. And I like the tinted sunscreens because uh, they have ferrous oxide in them, which really helps with discoloration. So women that struggle with melasma, which I'm one of them, uh, that ferrous oxide helps block the light that's coming in through the computer, the fluorescent lights, the other visible lights that we know contribute to discoloration and dispigmentation and melasma. So I usually just, uh, right now I have on a a tinted sunscreen, and that's it. I have no other makeup on. So I find that- Do you that mean something like kind of, I think I've seen HelioCare, is it? That do uh, HelioCare is a pill. Yeah, we could talk about that as well. That's that's a pill, it, HelioCare. There's another one, Helio. Helio. So I've used it and it's like tinted sunscreen. It's quite vibrant. It might be a European there's, brand. It's me, called HelioCare, yeah. H-E-L-I-O. C-A-R-E, yeah. yeah. They may have had a sunscreen now. I haven't used their oh, sunscreen. Okay. I use, uh, I like Elta MD. I like um, Elta. Elta, E L T A M D. Okay. That's really easily attainable. I like uh, Alumie MD. It's A L U M I E R M D. And I like uh, mm-hmm. Elastin, A L A S T I N, Hydra Tint. Pro, I think hydro tint. It's hydro tint. And so um, there's things that we can from our from our screens. So as we're speaking now on Zoom, that could be damaging and encouraging melasma. Yes, absolutely. Wow, as well as heat. That. Okay. Yeah. I didn't as know well that as could heat. damage our skin. I know. I know. And then the U the UV rays come in through the windows. So people will say, "I'm not outside," you know, at all. And I say, well, do you spend at least 10 minutes a day walking to and from your car, you know, driving in the car, going to the mailbox, walking your dog? I said, 10 minutes a day is at least an hour a week. And that's 52 hours a year. Would you go to the beach for 52 hours and not wear sunscreen? So that's basically what you're doing to the high real estate areas. We call it high real estate areas, like the the face, the chest, the neck, and the back of the hand. So those are the areas I recommend people wear sunscreen every day. And I do not recommend chemical sunscreens. I never have. They dissipate with heat. Uh, there, there's all sorts of health issues with them. So we used to use them quite a bit because they were more cosmetically elegant. But I find that the physical sunscreens have become a lot more cosmetically elegant and tolerable. And they have more of a, a nice feel on them, which makes you want to use them. They don't feel like plastic wrap on your face like they used to. And one of the mistakes I noticed that people do is they put their sunscreen on centrally to their nose and they wipe it out. And then I see brown spots all on the periphery of their face. So I recommend people put it on from their chest, up their neck, from the outside of their face, and then towards the center and rub it in all the way. And then take the rest on your hands and wipe the back of your hands and put it on when you're, you know, wearing a bra And then that way it's going to be covered by your clothing. And that's the only places I recommend wearing sunscreen. If someone's out all day, I recommend a hat, long sleeves, and barrier. Personally, I have changed my opinion over the last 20 years. I do try to expose my torso about 10 minutes, three times a week for vitamin D synthesis, because I think it's a little bit different getting it from the sun than taking a supplementation. I still do a supplement of 5,000 I use a day with vitamin K2 and magnesium so that I can convert into the active form of vitamin D. Um, But I do find that there's definitely sun benefits to expose your torso 10 minutes, three times a day. If you're fair skinned, if you're darker skinned, you need longer, but not my high real estate. (laughs) Okay. So it's this, and the sunscreen, just to be clear, is blocking that vitamin D synthesis. You can't make vitamin D with sunscreen. Yes, that's an yes. Ex- that's an excellent question. So SPF is based off of blocking UVB rays. 
there's no rating system on if something can block UVA rays. And UVA are the aging rays. Those are the ones that are deep penetrating that really destroy the collagen that come through the windows. And that's why the zinc oxide is so important because it covers the whole spectrum of UVA and UVB okay. because we have no rating system for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can't just go by the SPF when you're choosing a sunscreen. You want to make sure it's 30 or higher. You're applying it correctly and it has zinc oxide, titanium dioxide. Um, the okay. UVB are the burning rays. The UVB are the rays that produce vitamin D. Okay. So sunscreen will prevent you from that's forming vitamin D. So yes. this is interesting. So like with my kids, for example, lots of people listening to this, because I'm always pretty reluctant to put lots of sunscreen on my kids. I feel like a lot of them are chemically. And as you say, some of them definitely historically could be quite whitening. If you put it all over their body, it's quite thick. Um, but they're playing outside and my kids, my father's Lebanese, so we kind of, my husband's Sri Lankan, so we've not really had to worry about the children burning. Um, so I'll put some on their face sometimes. Do I need to be, like, do parents need to be, obviously there's people that have fairer hair, fairer skin, but do we need to worry about our kids getting skin cancer, aging their skin really young? Because they're not going to cover up. Like my daughter just takes anything and everything off as soon as she can. She gets hot. Yeah. How should we be with our children? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, when they're really small, it's easier to control. My youngest son was born in Hawaii. So we were at the beach every single day and they would wear a hat and it was part of the routine and they would have rash guards all over. We were exposed to sun every single day. They were getting sun through their eyes and, you know, getting, you know, their pineal gland activated and, you know, getting, getting the sunlight they needed to charge their body because sunlight is needed. So what I don't want to do is make people really fearful about how important the sun is. If you live somewhere where it's really dark all the time and you're not getting much sun, I would be a little bit less cavalier or more cavalier about, <clears throat> excuse me, about um, protecting from the sun. If you're outside every day and it is sunny hats, clothing are going to be the most important. And then I like for kids, I like a product called Vana cream. It's, it's very clean. There's no preservatives. There's, there's no chemicals in it at all. And that's kind of what I smeared on my children. They wore clothing and I put that on their face every day when we lived in Hawaii. Um, and in Arizona, now they're teenagers, they're not doing it so well, but they're also not spending as much time outside. So it really depends on the amount of sun exposure. If someone's getting burnt or if they have freckles, freckles are the first sign of aging. So we think they're cute in children. They're only formed in the response to trying to get darker skin to respond to the sun. So if a child is getting freckles, I know they're getting too much sun and they should be wearing sunscreen every single day. Interesting. On and their so, face. On their face. And so the um, the freckles do not come up in response to where the sun hits the body necessarily. They can come up anywhere, right? Or is, it, is it a direct response? So like if your child is getting some freckles on their back, does that indicate they've had too much sun on their back or just too much sun overall? Yeah, freckles are unusual on the back. Um, we usually see it on the shoulders, you know, where the sun will hit from above yeah. more. Um, they do get on the back, but that's later. So um, the, if you look at your arms, so if someone looks at their arms when they're our age, you'll see discoloration on the forearm. But when you turn the yes. arm up and you look There's at nothing. you know the area right by your armpit, that's how we naturally age. So the inside upper part of the arm, you might see a little bit of loss elasticity, but that's the natural color of your skin where you don't age. And that's how you nor normally age, just like your bottom, right? Like your tush is how you would normally age. Maybe a little bit of uh, loss of elasticity, but no other discoloration, no harsh wrinkles, no deep coarse lines or anything like that. The rest of that is caused by sun exposure. So um, freckles typically are on the nose and, you know, the prominence of the cheeks where the sun hits the most and the shoulders in the back. Um, and your genetics predisposes you to how much sun you get before you start getting freckles. So, um, yeah, that's the earliest sign of aging. And, you know, I, I do try to balance getting a little bit of sun, but in someone with very fair skin, really 10 minutes to the torso three times a week is going to be sufficient and protecting the, the areas that are chronically exposed, like the forearms, the back of the hands, especially in women where we don't want that to show our age, the neck, the decollete, and then the face.
Mm, interesting. Okay. So we definitely shouldn't be lying on a beach on holiday. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> Trust me, I've done it. You know, before I there's was a dermatologist. There's something when you come from the UK and you don't see any sun and you go on holiday, there's something incredible about how you feel after that. <laughs> it, you know, it's really interesting because I've had patients with so many skin cancers over the years and I try to get them to stop going in the sun so much. And mm. in Arizona, we see some serious sun damage with leather skin and brown yeah. with burns. And it, I, it looks like a rotisserie chicken. I'm just going to be honest with you. It, it, it looks really awful when you have that much sun exposure. And uh, there have been uh, quite a few research studies showing that the sun produces endorphins and it becomes addictive. Mm. So it actually is addictive. So I... I mean, I, I'm just not an absolutist. I don't say don't go, don't do it ever. I would just say, don't do it on a regular basis. You want to balance the enjoyment versus the risk of if you're burning, that's too much. You know, if you're, I'd say 20 minutes, isn't going to kill you 30 minutes and then get in the cabana, get under an umbrella, you know, and be a little bit smart about, about it. So you have some longevity to do this and live this life. Mm, yeah, for sure. Okay. So assuming we're not smoking and we're not overly exposing ourselves to the sun, I do want to dive into diet because I think it makes such a difference. But let's just like continue topically because we're talking about putting sunscreens and things on. What are the best things? Uh, like I've kind of, I've taken a big interest in this over the years. So like retinol something I've been using for quite some time. A lot of people massively fear it and they go, no, 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 I can't use that. I can't use that. My skin pe peels. I had a terrible experience. I was trying to get my husband to use it. And he was like, no, it's making my skin peel. That's not good. And it's like, no, 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 that gets better over time. <laughs> um, what, what are the key things that we need to look for in our personal care products uh, to help anti-age the skin from the outside? I know it's so overwhelming because there's so much on the market now. And unfortunately, the advertising, there's so many marketing claims that you you read and you think, oh, this is going to magically make it better because it's not it's not regulated at all here. Um, it, I can simplify it pretty well. So our skin has two processes. During the daytime, it's meant to protect us, right? So we want to add antioxidants uh, in during the daytime, like vitamin C and vitamin E, because um, with peptides are really nice. So if you can do vitamin C and vitamin E with a peptide in the morning, it has to be a high quality product because vitamin C is very volatile. And if it's hit by oxygen and light, it will turn brown and it will no longer be active. So I'll recommend somebody wash their face, maybe, you know, do a little exfoliation or a toner, put some vitamin C on their face, let it dry and absorb and soak, treat your neck your decolletage, the same as your face. This is one whole unit. Let it dry and then put your sunscreen on and that's, and then makeup after that. That's how I recommend people do things because what's happening is the sunscreen and the hat use will prevent the ultraviolet radiation from getting in. Um, but there will be free radicals forming that now the antioxidants can help protect you from DNA damage. And you mentioned HelioCare as a, um, a sunscreen. And I believe they do have a sunscreen. I haven't tried it. They have an excellent supplement uh, from Polypodium leucotomus, which is a fern block extract. And we know ferns have been around since the dinosaur age. And I have a certain passion in plant medicine and how, you know, we derive all these special qualities of plants that we then can utilize for our benefit. And this Polypodium leucotomus can help uh, prevent DNA damage in the skin. So I usually will recommend people take two of those in the morning. It helps with pigmentation as well. And if you're out for long periods of time, I personally don't wear sunscreen anywhere, but my face and my neck decolletage in the back of my hand. So I'll wear long sleeves. And then if I'm out for a hike, like I did yesterday, I just take it off and I'll get a little bit of sun and I don't burn when I take that. So it, they can, they cannot claim that there's an SPF associated with taking that pill, but studies have shown that it can be as much of an SPF of seven. So I find it very, very beneficial, especially in my athletes that are outside all the time. And that's now a night, supplement. And I've heard that astaxanthin can do the same thing, can help increase your natural sun protection. Is there any truth to that? Absolutely. I love astaxanthin. Okay. It's my absolute favorite supplement, um, about four milligrams a day. And that adds a nice little glow to your face too, a little rosy glow to your face. So I love astaxanthin and I love the properties of the Mediterranean diet and the foods that you can eat that can increase the SPF of your skin naturally, like lycopene and things like that. 
Um, okay. So then, so in the morning, we're going to use an antioxidant and a vitamin C serum and some SPF, natural one, and then evening. Exactly. So yeah. And the vitamin yeah. C, you want to make sure it's a really high quality product yes. because- Is there one that you not- recommend that you think is a really good vitamin C? Yeah, there, there's two that I like. Um, my favorite is uh, through a company called Illumier MD. It's A-L-U-M-I-E-R-M-D. And they have a vitamin C and E uh, plus a peptide in it. And peptides help stimulate collagen. And it's really nice because you receive the uh, three bottles for three months and you activate it with the powder on site. So you, it's not even activated mm-hmm. until you activate it and it lasts a month. So a um, little less for me because I'm putting it everywhere. Um, and I tend to just be kind of generous with it on my hands as well. Um, but it, it should last a month if you use it like a normal human. <laughs> and um, I like that one. I also like uh, Skin Medica makes a vitamin C and E that works well uh, as, as well. Uh, if someone has rosacea or acne prone skin, I have them avoid vitamin C and E until their skin is stabilized and less sensitive though, that I should note that. Yeah, because it can um, aggravate acne, can't it? What about hyaluronic acid? You didn't mention that because I find that that really helps me in terms of hydration. Do you recommend that? Yeah, I do like it. It has to be used properly. It draws in water. So uh, if it's not added to skin that has a little bit of moisture in it, it might suck out the water. So that would be the step in between the vitamin C and the sunscreen would be when I would apply it. And then sometimes if you're feeling a little dry, it's okay to like just spray your face, even with makeup on and add a little bit of hyaluronic acid on top of that. And it draws in 1500 times its water weight. Uh, It does not break people out. It's great for acne prone skin. And for people who are dry, I have that them add that to their moisturizer as a booster. I have them mix a little moisturizer on their hand and then add a little uh, hyaluronic acid and mix it all together to boost it, especially in oh, the you winter. you can do that. I didn't realize because I thought a hyaluronic acid had to go in first, as in the very first thing because of the weight. But you know what I've been doing is it's like spraying. I have like a pomegranate mist. So it has antioxidants, a natural one. And then I spray that and then put the hyaluronic. Or should I do hyaluronic and then spray the mist? I don't know. Does it no, matter? do the mist first. Yeah, mist do first. the mist okay. first. Yeah, exactly. You want to have a little moisture. So it's one of those things you want to put on as your skin is moist. So okay. I typically will add the actives first. And there have been studies um, when we talk about the night with the retinol. There have been studies looking at adding a moisturizer first, then with retinol versus the other way around. And it's fine. <laughs> it's still going to get You can do there. it either so, way, can you? It still gets that. You, you really can. So At night, our bodies are in the renew and the repair phase, which is why sleep is such an important part Mm. of it. There really is such a thing as beauty sleep. I'm I'm going on three hours last night. I couldn't sleep. I think it's a full moon thing. I don't know. But, um, and I'm feeling it today, you know, and, and we always notice this when we don't sleep well, we just don't have that same glow that we want. And over a long period of time that can cause a really big problem for the skin. So we want to do everything that we can at night to support renewal and repair. And the hero ingredient for that is vitamin A, and it comes in many different forms. Retin-A is the name brand people have heard for many years. Retinol is accessible over the counter and tends to be a little less irritating than the prescription strength. Is pres- is it prescription strength in, in England? We have different um, forms. So you can get different forms of retinol or retinoids. There's different grades. So you can have like here in the UK, there are some that you can buy over the counter, but they go up to a certain grade. And then you can go to like your aesthetician or, you know, beautician, and they will have a license to like examine your skin and then they move you up. So I've bought products where it's like graded. You start with this one, then another one, then another one as you move up. So it doesn't cause irritation. And then there's a higher end, I believe that then is prescription only, which I do have. So for example, I've used ones that are doctor's prescription, but they're still like dermatological doctors. And then I believe there's also something else, but I think this isn't topical. I think this is internal. Is it like Accutane? Doesn't it contain vitamin A that some people get if they've got acne primarily? Because vitamin A is good for acne, isn't it? It is. And um, I trained in Southern California and there's a lot of vanity there, you know? So we would actually prescribe Accutane when we would take one or two pills a week just to reduce the pore size. So it does work very well for reducing sebaceous glands or the oil glands. Oh, okay. And um, we also use it in uh, patients who've had kidney transplants to help prevent skin cancer. 
So vitamin A has so many benefits to it. The, the risk with using it, to, we, we don't want to just consume large amounts orally because it can cause liver failure. So I don't recommend doing that in, sub, in lieu of Accutane or in lieu of, um, you know, being monitored by a physician. But as far as topical goes, uh, the biggest mistake I find that people make is they, you know, they, they get to a certain age and then they are not happy with the way they look and they want to treat their wrinkles very aggressively. So they go to too strong of a form of uh, a vitamin, of basically a vitamin A, and they start getting exfoliating and peeling and a dermatitis. So the way it works is um, there's many different forms. Really the two main ones I advocate are retinol and then tretinoin, which turns into it's retinoic acid in the skin. So retinol will turn into retinoic acid in the, in the skin, which is the active form. And it works by cell signaling. So more application you don't need full coverage like you do with a moisturizer or a vitamin C because more application doesn't really make more cell signaling. It just can cause more irritation. Uh, and it, yeah, it works by unplugging the pores, which means exfoliation, which can come across as like sloughing of the skin and a dermatitis if too much is applied or it's applied too frequently. So I usually recommend just as you do it in the UK, starting off with a very low um, you know, a very, a modest, a modest type, not a very strong type to see how somebody tolerates it. And I find that retinol works very well. And I'll have people put a pearl size or a pea size on their finger, dot their forehead, dot each cheek, and then kind of massage it in, avoiding the creases of their nose and the creases of their mouth, because those areas, it will sit in there, kind of eat away at the skin. So that's the biggest issue I find people putting too much in those areas. And then as with everything on the face, I take the rest of my hands and sweep it on the, sweep it on the back of each hand because okay. we want to keep that area rejuvenated that as area well. Rejuvenated. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And they should start and build up slowly. What with a few times a week? Can you get to the point where like, I mean, I've had ones where I do use them every day and then some, they just seem really strong. I can only use them a few times a week. Yeah. You, I've been using it for that? 20 years. Yeah. For, I've been using it for 20 years and there's some I can't even get to every night. So retinol, I'll have people start three times a week and then wait two weeks. And if they're not irritated, then I have them go every other night for another two weeks. If they're not irritated, we'll go um, two nights on one night off for another two weeks. And we slowly graduate that way. And once they're on retinol every single night for about three months, then, and they're tolerating it fine and no issues. Um, and I do have people apply it up to the eyelid margins. A lot of people are afraid to use things near the eyes. Um, and I find that if you don't, your eyes are going to look different and age different from the rest of your skin. So, um, I do treat the entire face. I just use much, much less around the eyes, much less around the neck, much less around the decolletage. So those areas are, you know, typically a three time a week, and uh, less application until you graduate and you, you kind of have to be intuitive with your skin. There's no real recipe because it, you have to check in with yourself. Are you getting itchy? Are you getting red? Are you getting flaky? Skip a night, you know, and then restart. And sometimes things will change. If you had an inflammatory meal of, you know, seed oils and fried food, you might have more inflammation in your skin and not tolerate the skincare products. If it's winter time and the air is dry and the humidity is low, you might not tolerate what you were tolerating over the summer. So there's a lot of variables with that. And if they're doing that, then I'll graduate them to tretinoin, uh, which is the generic form of Retin-A, and there's many other forms. And we'll just slowly go that way. Studies have shown that tretinoin 0.25% versus a, uh, I'm sorry, a 0.025% versus a 0.1% um, are the same at six months. So with the stronger percentages, you will get results quicker you'll have more irritation, you'll get results quicker, but over six months with full collagen stimulation, you end up getting great results. So more isn't necessarily better. And going more, yeah, because it costs you more as well, doesn't it, when you go up and you have more in it. Um, okay, and what about things like, I guess I guess my question would be, because I use some of them, medical grade products, this is always the difficulty. So I tend to be somebody, because it's a balance, right, as someone who's into health, where on my body, because the skin is such a large organ, I will pretty much use 
only natural oils because that's not being regularly exposed. You know, your face gets outside of the, is exposed to the sun every day um, and all the elements and everything else and the toxins. So I tend to go, right, it's natural on my body, but I'll use a more medical based product, which probably breaks some rules in terms of natural healthcare, because I feel like, yes, they may contain ingredients that maybe aren't ideal, but it's a small amount. I'm using it on my hands, my face, and I want results, right? And I find that, do you think you can get the same anti-aging results <clears throat> from natural skincare products that are things, you know, like shea, rose oil, natural forms of vitamin A or... Yeah, I've done quite a bit of, (laughs) I've done quite a bit of research on this. Um, You can get similar results. Like there's a product called Bakuchiol, B-A-K-U-C-H-I-O-L. That's a natural plant that has similar properties to retin, to retin A and retin and retinol. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been less than impressed. It doesn't cause as much irritation. It's an option, you know, it's an option. I haven't been as impressed and, you know, these are vitamin A, you know, it's not... I, I agree with your perspective, basically, you know, on the important areas, the cosmetic areas, I tend to go more medical on the body, you know, with deodorant, toothpaste, all the other cos, you know, cosmetics that we use. I am very natural with that as well. And, um, but I do have a trick for, for body elasticity. Yeah. I will take, um, it, it can cost a lot of money, but I use a product called Epicurin, which is basically coconut oil based. Um, it's E P I C U R E N. And it's a really nice body lotion. It's very clean. And I will take that and mix an entire tube of retin-A in there and then Mm. apply it head to toe three times a week. And I think it helps with the elasticity and pigmentation on the skin as well. And where do you get the retin-A to mix with it? Is that just, you can get it as a doctor or can people buy that? It's a prescription. Yeah. You can do retinol, but I find that a higher percent Retin-A is going to be more cost effective because you just put the entire tube of a higher percentage, which your body can tolerate three times a week, as opposed to a small retinol that's better for a small area like your Mm -hmm. face. So if, uh, you know, whatever the strongest strength you can get in the UK of the tretinoin, I would mix that with, you know, a good 16 ounce bottle of, uh, 16 ounce. Do you do ounces? No, you do Milliliters, no, don't you? <laughs> I have no okay. idea what that is. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what, whatever a standard bottle is, just mix a whole tube in there. It's not a science and art and just shake it up as well as you can. So it's integrated and apply it three times a week. And it really helps. Like a lot of women don't like the crepiness on their knees or, mm. you know, it helps with some of the, the arm damage and the hand damage. And just remember less is more and three times a week of that is great. And then the rest of the week, do your normal moisturizer. And you always want to put moisturizer on immediately after exiting this shower before you dry and you want to seal in the moisturizer. I mean, seal in the water. So you kind of pat dry with a towel and then put the moisturizer on. Okay. Absolutely. And on your, um, on your face. So apart from the retin-A as, or (laughs) the retin-A, I get confused between the different ones. What, whatever someone is purchasing that they can get hold of, whether that's prescription or normal, They want to be using vitamin A. What else? Are they going to use any um, like growth serums, peptides, more hyaluronic acid, any oils at night? You know, I found that oils seem to work. I felt I needed oils for ages and I always relied on them in my 30s. And then now in my sort of mid 40s, actually what I'm finding is my skin doesn't like the oils anymore. It's kind of like it's too much. It just becomes too oily. So our skin changes, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. It changes as we age. It changes through the seasons. It changes through the month as our hormones change. So this is where you want to become in tune with your body. And I believe in cycling uh, skincare. So okay. we, we cycle, cool. we talked about this and, yeah. you know, we cycle every month, the moon cycles, the, the season cycle, the tide cycle, everything cycles. So um, I like to cycle skincare. And what I'll do is I'll go through phases where I want people to exfoliate quite a bit. You know, if you're feeling dry, that usually is excess skin. And what happens is, is over time, as we age, our stem cells 
are not working as well and we're not regenerating new skin as quickly. So the skin is staying there. It's adhering to the face and it's not exfoliating. So if you're really dry, that's usually you need a little exfoliation because any products you put on your face are not even going to penetrate because it's forming a barrier and insulating your, the rest of your healthy skin from penetrating products. So if someone's very dry and they don't have a little glow to their skin, I'll use some exfoliation. Um, there's, I, I don't really like scrubs at all. I like more enzymes, papaya enzymes, things like that. Um, gosh, there's so many great ones out there. Lavanya makes a nice one. L A V A N Y A. Uh, Lavanya makes a nice exfoliating elixir. I used it this morning and I really like it a lot. You leave it on for about 10 minutes and, um, take that off. The Illumi AMD makes a nice little exfoliating elixir. And you just do that until you can, you know, you don't want to be irritated, but you also want to remove the dead skin cells. So I'll go through cycles where I want people to exfoliate. And then I go through cycles where I want people to really hydrate. So in the winter or in dry climates or dry weather, you want to uh, hydrate more. And that's where at night we'll do a vitamin A, a retinol. So the two hero, th- the three hero things you want to remember are sunscreen, physical sunscreen with zinc oxide, titanium dioxide in the morning after vitamin C and the vitamin, the vitamin E at night. Okay. Whether it's retinol or tretinoin or retin-A, those are the most important for medical results driven treatment. Okay. Peptides are great at stimulating collagen. That's a bonus that I'll rotate in and out, or I try to find products that contain peptides in a moisturizer, or like the Illumi AMD has peptides in their vitamin C and E serum in the morning. So peptides are a bonus. Uh, it's It stimulates collagen, but it's not quite as hero of a product as I think and the others are. And then growth factors uh, can sometimes cause little acne breakouts in some people. I think that uh, TNS from Skin Medica is the best growth factor out there. It's it's human derived, and uh, it works the best. And I will have people rotate that in and out as well. As far as how to use it, you do not want to use it uh, in the morning if you're using the. Actually, it depends on which vitamin C you're using because it can be a little bit sensitive to an acidic environment if you're too acidic. But I would have people use it at night, like a TNS recovery complex uh, at night would be the first step because you really want to go from thinnest to thickest when you're applying your products at night. And I just know that that's thinner than the retinol. Otherwise the retinol would come first. And I have people cycle in and out of that. So if they're older and we're on the other regimen and I'm not seeing results, that's where I pull the other things in for a short period of time, or I'll rotate through for three months. So I, I tend to cycle every three months because it takes three months for the skin cell to cycle through. So if I'm treating acne or brown spots or wrinkles or collagen stimulation, whatever I'm doing needs to take a full three months to cycle through before I can see if it's actually helping. And then at that point, I evaluate the skin to see if they need more exfoliation or we need to address brown spots or we're struggling with some fine lines and wrinkles and I want to attack it in a different way. That's where you kind of need to work with someone. Mm. Yeah, for sure. They need to, um, someone like yourself to look at their skin. So um, in terms of, you were saying that, you know, if people have been really good with what they're doing and what they're eating, and I'm going to come on to food in a minute, um, between sort of the ages of thir- like 30 onwards, then by 50, they can actually have better skin than some 30 year olds. What about for people that are maybe listening and they haven't been paying attention and now they've started to see these wrinkles appear? Can they reverse or is it just about managing it from going forward? Yeah, I think that you can reverse it somewhat. You know, I mean, you'll you'll need procedures. If you have deep, deep uh, coarse wrinkles on the cheeks, you, you likely need a procedure. Skin care is not going to be enough. If someone has tons of wrinkles around their mouth, um, and typically what I do when I evaluate someone, if they have uh, deep, coarse wrinkles around their mouth, if I can stretch it out with my fingers, I think that I can treat it with mild procedures like Botox or with chemical peels or with products. But if they have wrinkles that when I stretch them, they still stay in place, they need a deep resurfacing laser or a more aggressive treatment. And that's because the collagen is just so disorganized at a deep level that we need to get to that deep level that nothing can penetrate in order to um, help remodel that collagen. 
Got you. Okay. And what about things like the, they call it in the UK, the vampire facial, where they take some of your blood and spin it and put it, inject it back in the face. Does that work well? Yeah. So what we're trying to do basically with that is um, it has to be done properly. So it's PRP or platelet rich plasma or PRF platelet rich fibrin. You could even inject it under the eyes as well to kind of help uh, stimulate collagen for people that look a little hollow there. And, um, it works, it works pretty well. The issue with that is we're, we're trying to get your own stem cells in the body from yourself and then injecting it back in to stimulate stem cells, which will regenerate cells and renew things and create a healthier look. As we get older, our stem cells aren't healthy anymore. So after the age of 50, our stem cells tend to deteriorate, obviously at different rates, depending on our overall health, um, but they're not as good as they were when we were 20, when we actually didn't need those stem cells, right? So there's something called exosomes, which are basically the little mess the messengers of the stem cells. And exosomes are what we're using as well now to help stimulate. So I'll often do a microneedling treatment on someone to stimulate collagen and apply exosomes to the face at the same time to stimulate and rev up those stem cells to start working. So you kind of need to take your teenage daughter in and just say, we're going for a PRP together and I'm going to use <laughs> your stem cells and you're just get, you're going to give me the blood and then I'll have the facial. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great in an ideal world. It might, in it might an be considered world. Child, child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> it could be child abuse, couldn't it? <laughs> um, oh, I love that. It's funny. Okay. And um, talking about the... Um, the derma rolling there. Okay. So that's something that I quite often do with a smaller, obviously not as long needle at nighttime, because I believe that helps with product penetration. It can go a bit deeper. Although if you've got good quality products, they're going in anyway. But I was taught that if you roll before, you're going to get, it's going to really penetrate deeper into the deeper layers of the skin. Yeah, that's always the, that's always the trick is getting it to penetrate. Right. And that's why there's such a disparity in the cost of products because more medical grade products have the science behind them to actually penetrate the skin. Like you mentioned with hyaluronic acids, not all hyaluronic acids are the same. Some have small molecular weight hyaluronic acid mixed with larger molecular weight, and you want the combination effect. So the smaller molecular weight can penetrate and give you kind of a dewy rosy glow. Whereas the higher molecular weight sits on the skin and allows you to look, you know, like you're hydrated. Um, whereas the cheaper versions or the least expensive versions don't have that science behind them. And the same with the vitamin C, it doesn't, it won't, uh, be active once it leaves the bottle, if it's not formulated properly. So, um, I don't love derma rolling only because it tends to shear the skin. So, um, if people don't do it properly and they're aggressive with it, it can shear the skin. If you have a mild version that where you're trying to, uh, basically compromise the skin just enough to allow products to penetrate. I do find it to be very effective. Derma, um, the microneedling is different. It's more of a stamp method where we stamp about one to even one and a half millimeters deep into the skin. And it's basically hormesis. Like, you know, our bodies are different from machines. So uh, a machine gets worn out over time. So you drive a car and it gets worn out, you know, after a hundred thousand or 200,000 miles or, uh, the equivalent of kilometers and it wears out and our bodies are different. If we sit around all day, it doesn't function. It gets weaker and weaker and weaker. So we go to the gym and we exercise and our muscles get stronger and our bones get stronger. The same with the skin. We're trying to find that line between, causing enough damage to not cause a scar, because that would be too much, just like going to the gym and lifting too much weight is going to cause you to herniate a disc or pull something. You want to work your muscles so they get stronger when and repair, just like we want to stimulate the collagen. So it says, oh, there's some insult, there's some damage, and I need to repair and remodel and get thicker. So that's where I like microneedling, the derma roller, if it's done correctly at home. Um, not too aggressively though, because you can cause scarring. And mm. that stimulates the collagen to form and also allows more penetration of good active products, um, which I don't love vitamin C with microneedling because there have been some cases of chronic uh, 
kind of erythematous red bumps forming from that after a microneedling treatment. I personally experienced that. So I looked into uh, the literature really deeply and I realized what I had done wrong. So um, I usually avoid the vitamin C right afterwards, but hyaluronic acid is a beautiful thing to apply right after microneedling as okay. well as exosomes. The exosomes are great for stem cell stimulation. And it just stimulates collagen to form. It works excellent for like those little lines around the corners of the mouth. I love it for that. Amazing. And if you wanted to like, if you're doing it gently at home and you want to stimulate that collagen, how long do you actually have to roll for to create that stimulus? Because yeah, your face gets just... red, doesn't it? It gets relatively red quite quickly because you are obviously stimulating the blood flow as well, right? Anything you rub on something on your skin. Yeah, the redness I'm okay with. Um if there's bleeding, I would start to be concerned. Um, there should not be really too much bleeding with the at-home devices. They should maybe be, uh, do you know the depth of yours? Uh, no, I can't remember actually, because I had one and it was too deep. And actually I didn't use it because it felt like it didn't make it bleed, but it, I felt like it increased um, like problems like acne. So I can't remember what mine is because there was one that was just too much. But I thought that you could do it kind of for a minute just to help with product penetration, but to go deeper, do it, to get the benefits of collagen stimulation, you need to do it for quite some time, do you? That was my understanding. I could be wrong. Yeah. In the office, we numb people because it is very painful because we are going deeper to stimulate collagen. You have to get into the dermis to stimulate collagen. Um, but that, would, that usually causes a little bit of pinpoint bleeding. At home, you're not going to get as deep because if you do number one, it's going to hurt. You should be changing the roller every time. It should be a new roller. I would not use the same roller because of infection, the risk of introducing an infection. Um, and then going over the area one time is going to be enough in each direction. Okay. So that's what I would recommend. I'd go vertical, you know, all through the areas, and then I'd go horizontal. And I typically include, you know, the jaw yeah. every single time because who doesn't want their jaw lifted a little bit? You know, yeah. nobody wants those jaws. So, but I, I don't have a ton of experience with what's on the market with derma rollers because I typically see the people that are in the office for the, um, for the microneedling for the device. Full treatment. Yeah. And we do numb them because it's, it's pretty painful. Um, so I assume if you're not feeling a lot of pain, you're probably okay with whatever depth it's going, but what mm. I wouldn't do is just dig at it and kind of keep no. rolling it again and again and again, because you can introduce a scar and then make sure you use a new tip every time or a new device every time to not introduce infection. And, um, what about other things like massage, for example, facial massage using things like, is it the gua sha where you kind of pull out how much, and these are good for lymphatic drainage. You can kind of just roll around the face. How much of this do you find makes a, a difference? I have a device, but I just now don't get around to using it as much called a face gym where it does like electrical stimulation and you're meant to lift it. Uh, I don't know if you've yeah. come across that one. I don't know the face gym, but uh, there's one called new face and it works pretty well. Um, I think anytime you can do anything to stimulate circulation and lymphatic drainage, it's going to help. I think with the gua sha and I, I have it, I never use it. I actually debated on throwing one of them out last night because I'm like, I never use this. It really has to be rolled in a certain way to, you know, support lymphatic drainage and they don't have to be refrigerated. They're, they're cold at the Jade rollers basically are cold at the temperature they're at. I think it's a nice thing to do if you're getting a facial and having them introduce it. I'm not, it's not a, it's kind of an add on as far as I'm concerned in the prioritization, you know, because there's so much out there, you could actually get stressed and raise your cortisol and cause more aging just over all of using all of these things and having too many steps at night. <laughs> too many so things. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it defeats the purpose. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, just before we leave the face, what about um, rosacea? Two common complaints, rosacea, acne, particularly perimenopause just seems to, for so many people, bring on these spots. What what can they do on both? So should we do rosacea and then acne? Sure. Yeah. Rosacea, um, we're finding is more and more is linked to the gut microbiome. Okay. So I really have people try to, you know, figure it out with their diet and what, what's going on. Um, I'll find a lot of them are on proton pump inhibitors and, um, it just, 
really throws off the whole entire gut microbiome with um, that lack of acid and ability to digest properly. Maybe they have some small intestinal bacterial overgrowth like SIBO. So I'll get them to a functional medicine doctor and clean that up. Um, and just avoiding triggers like chemicals. So definitely no chemical sunscreens. Um, zinc oxide is calming. So I think that's fine. As far as topical for rosacea, I like things like azelaic acid, uh, I like, which can be found over the counter. I love niacinamide. Uh, which can be found over the counter in many products. It's very soothing. I also like oral niacinamide, 500 milligrams twice a day, uh, because I find that to be very calming and soothing. And I use that both for acne and for rosacea. It's been shown um, in studies to be equivalent to antibiotics for acne um, in many cases. So I like niacinamide, 500 milligrams twice a day. For acne um, as well, you're saying? For acne, yeah. And does that acne, cause flushing it. or...? No, niacin causes flushing, but niacinamide okay, doesn't. Or yeah, niacinamide. Oh, niacinamide, doesn't. which you can get. You can get niacinamide topically, can't you? In in serums, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's oh, in but you're serums. suggesting orally five hundred milligrams twice a day. So like morning yes. and night. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they also have it in Elta MD that has a, a tinted sunscreen and an untinted version. It's Elta MD clear and that contains niacinamide also. Mm -hmm. So I like that in my acne prone patients and my um, patients that have uh, rosacea, especially with the tint because it helps with the redness. Um, I have rosacea and for me, my trigger is going from cold weather into, um, near a fireplace and I just turn really red or, you know, a glass of wine will cause that as well. So everyone has to identify their personal triggers, whether it's spicy food or hot food or sunlight or temperature variations and try to avoid that as much as possible. And then I find when people have healthier guts, their rosacea is under better control. It's very controllable once you identify the cause and it takes a little bit of a detective work and then the willingness to make those changes. Mm. And do you find that gut health is linked to acne as well, or is that more hormonally driven? Um, I can't say that, you know, there's certain uh, strains of uh, probiotics or anything like that, that help with acne, but I do, um, it's been, it's very clear now when I, when I trained, it was, we were told that acne is not affected by diet whatsoever. And the opposite is true. I mean, I didn't pay attention to that. I was a nutrition major. I listened to my patients. There were very clear causalities of patients that were well controlled on Accutane with zero outbreaks. And then they'd go home for Christmas and eat a lot of food, a lot of cakes and a lot of cookies, and they would come back and be broken out. So, you know, I always have known that a lot of sugar is associated with acne. And now the research is in sugar and high glycemic load is associated with acne. So um, for me, I may not have sugar, but I wear a continuous glucose monitor at times. If I have white rice, my glucose will jump up to 250. I'm very, very sensitive to uh, starchy foods. And, you know, your body is smart. It will convert oatmeal or it will convert granola or it will convert uh, pasta to sugar very quickly in the body. So anything that is processed it, flowers especially will convert to sugar in the body. And that high glycemic load leads to acne as well as dairy. Dairy is clearly mm, associated yeah, with dairy acne. Dairy is a big one, isn't it? But it it for, really is. Mm. Yeah. And I have a lot of um, fitness competitors that I treat and they'll say, I'm not having any dairy, but they're taking in whey protein and pr whey protein bars. Mm. So even the whey protein can be associated with it. And casein a hundred percent is casein is very inflammatory. So I'll, I'll usually have people cut out, uh, dairy and sugar and they, most people see a remarkable response. It's not in everyone. Some people are not, uh, sensitive to dairy so they can reintroduce it. And then if they don't break out, they're not one of those sensitive people, but I do eliminate it initially because I do find that that's an issue. And in and women, even, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh no, you go ahead. Go, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. Carry on in women. Okay. So yeah. So that's like for regular acne. Then that we have the adult form of female acne, which is a whole different thing. Okay. So I, I can jump into that unless you had a follow-up question on the regular acne. Yeah, actually, yeah. While we're on the regular acne, it was around, I was told, I think by a, um, a, probably someone in some beauty clinic that basically where you get acne 
determines on what the cause may be. So for example, if you're getting, I think I was told if you're getting spots and breakouts on your forehead, that signified potentially stress and liver detoxification. Whereas if you were getting it around the chin and the jawline, that tended to be more hormonal. I have no idea if there's truth to that. Is there any truth to where these, where acne occurs? Sometimes is the answer. Okay. <laughs> so I, I believe in teenage acne, not, not so much. Some teenagers tend to get it in the T-zone or their cheeks or their shoulders. Um, but with female adult hormonal acne, it's always on the jawline and the chin. Okay. So it's um, the difference between rosacea and adult hormonal acne. So rosacea will be central, like in the central part of the face, there may or may not be flushing associated with it, but you'll, you will have breakouts. You'll never have blackheads and whiteheads with um, rosacea. And then it tends to burn or tingle and, and feel a little painful, but adult hormonal female acne is around the jaw and the chin. And if you try to pick it, nothing's going to come out. There's yeah, nothing because that's it's gonna... kind of cystic, right? Yeah. It's cystic yeah. and it's so deep. It's caused from an internal thing, not an ex, you know, you can't really treat it externally. You have to treat the internal causes and, um, the pimples last forever. They're not like the one week pimples you might get sometimes it's, it's, a, they last a good month. You know, they last a long time and they usually leave a little discoloration there afterwards. And I started seeing, I was the only dermatologist in my residency in 2001 to 2004, the only female. So all the women with hormonal acne, want, they wanted to see the female, you know, because they figured I would understand better, right? So I saw a ton of it and I was so perplexed because I was wondering like, why are we seeing so much acne in adults? So I asked the program director, you know, why do we see it? Did you see this 20, 30 years ago? And he said, no, we didn't. So oh. it's always been in the back of my mind. Why are we getting this? Mm. Right. And I think it comes down to the hormone disruptors in our environment. So I have an entire protocol that I do for people like stay away from plastic don't touch the receipts with the phthalates on them. Avoid BPA, you know, avoid all plastics, even BPA free plastics, because they are endocrine disruptors. Avoid phthalates, you know, that's why we talked about the preservatives and things in our cosmetics and being careful of what kind of lotion we put on our body and what we put on large areas of our body because this stuff is absorbed. I don't take receipts when I go to the store because there's phthalates on them. And when you have hand sanitizer on your hand and you grab a receipt, it's absorbed five times faster than if you didn't have hand sanitizer on and it accumulates in the body and it goes through the liver. The liver tries to detox it. Now the liver can't balance hormones and we tend to become estrogen dominant over time, which I know you talked about with Dr. Anna Kabeka and that estrogen dominance causes all sorts of problems from, you know, very heavy periods to lots of acne on the face, hair growth, things like that. So I have people avoid um, the plastics and pesticides and stick with organic foods, um, especially in America. We have so many pesticides and our wheat is filled with glyphosate and it's, it's very, very toxic. So even organic foods have some sort of glyphosate in it. So I have people really try to stay farm fresh as local as possible and have as many fresh foods as possible and then go for an uh, anti-inflammatory diet. So avoid the nut seed oils, avoid canola, soy, soy oil, which are pretty much in every dressing and every uh, bottle of you know mm. a dressing that you can buy over the counter. So those are the big things I have people avoid. Yeah, anti-inflammatory diet I think is so key, isn't it? The 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 pro-inflammatory fats show up on your skin. You're more likely to burn, I think, in the sun as well if you're having a lot of seed oils and things, aren't you? Um, mm. and yeah, as opposed to colorful vegetables and colorful mm. flu fruits, those phytonutrients impart the color on our skin, which allows for a natural sun protection to our skin. So it's if you eat potato chips you know, then you're going to have no protection and sallow skin. And if you have colorful fruits and vegetables, you're going to get that color, just like the astaxanthin or wild Alaskan salmon. Um, you're going to be imparting that color on your skin. It's going to naturally protect you just like these fruits and vegetables have protected themselves from the sun, which is why organic is that much more important because the ones that survive have the most phytonutrients in mm. it because they've been able to, uh, you know, 
protect themselves through hormesis to be able to um, have the most phytonutrients that, that help you. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more on that nutrition <laughs> side of things. It's interesting though, what you're saying there about the hormone, well, the plastics, I guess they are disrupting our hormones, but we're just seeing it what it's just more prevalent because women in perimenopause are going through this hormone disruption anyway. So then it's aggravating and causing this cystic acne. Is that why? Like, Why would we see that cystic acne so much more in women in their 40s than say their 30s when they may be having the same exposure? Or is it the build up? Is, or do you think it's the interplay with what is already a disruptive time in terms of hormones and estrogen dominance? Yeah, I think it's a combination of of what you just said. And I'm seeing it in the 20s and 30s as well. So I see a lot of women between 25 and 35 who are having it when I know that they're not anywhere near perimenopause, you know, and they're still having a lot of acne and cortisol plays a role as well. So one of my prescriptions is meditation or breathing, you know, as simple as when you're in mass transit or in your car or standing in a line, just doing the four, seven, eight breath. I like Dr. Andrew Wiles, four, seven, eight breath, or we talked about different breathing on my podcast. All of those breathing exercises are very useful in reducing cortisol, which cortisol prevents the natural production of other hormones as well as displaces it from being active. So cortisol management is very important as well. And, um, that can happen at any age, you know, and especially in the last year, it's been, it's been very difficult for many people in, in many respects. Um, and then, uh, so I think it's, you know, it's a combination of what's causing it. And also the more insults we have to our liver, the more difficult we have in processing the, uh, you know, the, the bad estrogens from our body basically that are causing these things. So if there's a lot of alcohol involved, if there's a lot of other chemicals that we're consuming, which we are, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, we weren't consuming the processed foods that we're consuming. Mm -hmm. So I think about, you know, soda, if someone has soda, your body's going through an enormous amount of metabolic processes and liver taxation in order to just get water out of it. So like we're doing that all day long with food yeah. after food after food that when it comes time to metabolize our own hormones, they're, they're being pushed, pushed by the wayside and they're low priority. So you have to take a look at all of the other things you're doing in your life. I don't like acetaminophen. I don't have people take acetaminophen or paracetamin, paracetaminophen. I think you have it there. Para- Paracetamol. Paras- yeah. Paracetamol is what it's called there because that's, that's liver toxic. So I just, I just use regular aspirin, you know, unless you have Mm -hmm. an ulcer because it's not liver toxic. So all of these things accumulate over time and our liver can only take so much. That's why fasting is so important to give everything a break, to kind of regenerate, repair, get rid of the zombie cells and just get a little bit of a fresh start. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And it, the thing is as well, isn't it? Like even when you're drinking water from a glass, you know, it's, there's so many plus there's plastics in our water. So the more we cut down on this, the better, cause we can't, we can't escape it. Um, so we're having, um, no, we're having, that's a good point. I wanted to bring up, I use, um, I use the British Berkey, oh, yeah. which is yet yeah, has a great filter in it. Um, because you know, I don't, the, the chlorine and the fluoride and, I had a patient many years ago who worked for um, the EPA and she said that there's so many things they're unable to clean out of the water supply, you know, from hormones. Mm -hmm. So people are putting their contraceptives down the toilet and we can't get these out of the water supply. So we're consuming other people's contraceptives. We're consuming things like Splenda or sucralose because they can't seem to clean that out of the water supply either. So there's so many things that are coming from municipal sources that we're that are taxing our bodies that we don't even realize. And then when you drink water, I just carry a stainless steel water bottle everywhere, like a hydro flask or a glass bottle. I'm, I'm clumsy. So I don't do glass. I do stainless steel. It has lots of dents in it. And, um, I just carry that everywhere and fill it up and it's great for traveling. It's great for the environment and it's great for my health. And, um, you know, I try to use the clean, the cleanest filtered water that I can possibly get because it's becoming a big issue. Water, water quality. It is, isn't it? And I think here we are, I did quite a lot of investigating because I know in America, 
there's is so much more the water supply is is less here we're quite lucky i know for example like the water where i am in surrey in uk it's from like a reservoir which is mostly from rainwater they've got really high standards but then if you look in a city absolutely people you know the contraceptives that people are peeing out um is is in the water supply and i think again it depends where you live um but it is it is it is it is a challenge isn't it that's the thing it is a real challenge just to stay less toxic than we want to be and when you look at like babies how many toxins they're born with it's just incredible when you think they should be they come out sterile effectively they shouldn't really have all of this um right and through the umbilical cord they're getting somewhere like 284 toxins you know every crazy yeah, it is it? it is yeah um before you go there were a couple of other things because i know listeners will be wanting to know the answer to this how do you get rid of and can you get rid of cellulite that's a big thing for people and you know i'm always suggesting that we do all the things we've been talking about really cleaning up your diet staying away from pro-inflammatory oils and i suggest things like body brushing sauna if they have access to it what can we do i mean actually one of the things that an article i was reading recently which is interesting is that combining body brushing with red light therapy actually seems to have results on um on cellulite and and red light therapy in itself is very good isn't it for collagen um and helping stimulate collagen production so i was just curious what your thoughts were like with cellulite and what people could do yeah you know cellulite's been a, a challenging thing for a long period of time and we haven't really had good treatments. When I uh, wrote articles for Fitness RX magazine years ago, I wrote a whole article on cellulite. And it was kind of the conclusion was like, you, you kind of have what you have, you know, um, because there's very thin people who were in shape and they have cellulite. And what causes cellulite is basically we have these kind of fibrous areas um, in our body. They're everywhere, but they're most prominent around our hips and our thighs and our legs. And in the fibrous areas, um, little pockets of fat can pooch out and you don't have to have a lot of fat in order for it to pooch out. I do believe based on personal observations and some of the literature that there is um, a little, a lot of toxins that build up that can cause this. So the cleaner you are and um, the more water you drink, the more you can kind of clean out your toxins. So I always say dilution is a solution to pollution. Mm -hmm. And people like will that. often say I'm puffy and I don't want to drink water because I'm going to get more puffy. But the opposite is true. The more water you drink, actually, the less your body will retain and it will naturally balance out if you have healthy kidneys. So I make sure someone's adequately, adequately hydrated uh, with water and um, to ensure, you know, that you're getting enough, your urine should be clear. And then um, if it's bright yellow, you're not getting enough water. And then I do like body brushing. I think it stimulates uh, circulation and lymphatic drainage, which is always going to help move things along. Uh, exercise is very important because the muscles are gonna squeeze the lymphatics and move things along. So exercise is important. Um, I find weight bearing exercise to be very important. Um, doing a lot of leg exercises in the gym because the stronger your muscles are, your muscles are a metabolic organ that are gonna that's gonna burn fat and displace some of you know this disorganized cellulite. Um, when it's strong and healthy and supple. So don't overlook those things. Weight-bearing exercise, not cardio, not walking and Stairmaster and step, Stepper and stuff, but actually lifting weights to form that curvy muscles that you want. Mm. And um, also I do I'm love always trying to get my clients to lift weight and everyone to lift weight. So many women are reluctant or they don't like it. And it's like, it's almost like brushing your teeth. Like it doesn't matter whether you like it. You've just got to lift weights like two to three times a week. You need to, because as you say, it's a metabolic organ. And I just think if people could understand like the run just isn't going to cut it, it just isn't going to get yeah. you the results that we're looking for. And as you say that those kind of sexy curves are muscles and we just lose that as we get older, if we don't pay attention. We do. And cosmetic procedures have gotten so good that we can really, you know, fix someone's face and their neck and their decolletage and even the back of their hands. But I always say you can tell someone's over 50 by the flatness of their butt. So if you're lifting weights and doing squats mm -hmm. and working out in the gym, you can keep a curvy arch in your back and a nice plump, you know, lifted 
tush and it, it can look good, but you have to do the weights. And the cool thing about weightlifting is that, um, when you do it, you're building muscle that's burning tons of calories the rest mm. of the day. Whereas when you do cardio, you only, you, it increases your appetite remarkably. And then you're not burning extra calories the rest of the day. The weight, the building, the muscle is going to raise your regular metabolic rate. And before we got on here, we talked about jowls and how to lift the jowls. Mm. The yeah. reason I love weights and weight bearing exercise and lifting heavy things, you know, like your body or you know, lifting in the gym is because it stimulates your bone to become stronger and your muscles to become stronger. And that supports and scaffolds your cheeks and your face and your skin. And if your jaw becomes thinner because your muscles and your bones become thinner, everything's going to sag more. So interesting. So when you're lifting the weights elsewhere on your body is supporting bone structure all over the body, including the face, not just the bones that are being directly affected by that weight that's been lifted in that exactly. area. Exactly. Wow. Yes. That's powerful. I know. It's so powerful. Mm, exactly. So that's I why that. I know weights are huge. Um, cool. But going back to the red light, love red light. If you can get a high quality red light, not a red, not a red painted light bulb. Um, I personally use the juve red light. I didn't bring it up with me this summer. I'll miss it, but I'll get outside every day. And, um, I love the red light because you're getting the red light, not the rest of the ultraviolet radiation light. And it, it does stimulate collagen. And we want that collagen to be stimulated over time because it, it naturally degrades and inflammation is the number one thing that's going to cause collagen to degrade. So avoiding inflammation, stimulating collagen, those are really, that's how we break it down to be the keys. And how do we stimulate collagen? Um, red light is one of those things, the vitamin A at night, the retinol is one of the things that help exercise and then, uh, procedures that cause little, little trauma, like the microneedling devices. Those are how we stimulate collagen, preventing collagen breakdown, vitamin C in the morning, um, avoiding inflammatory foods, uh, and basically everything else we talked about. <laughs> and do you recommend taking collagen orally? There seems to be some debate over how much you need. When I did the research, it seems that a lot of them contain like seven and they say it's so, you know, it's hydrolyzed, it's so bioavailable, but it's only got seven grams. My understanding from researching it is that you need at least 20 grams to make an impact because it's kind of tricking your body that why have you got all this circulating? There must be some kind of injury and then it produces more of its own collagen and you just gave it the, the raw ingredients to actually do that, all the amino acids. But then I also read that, you know, some Sometimes you read articles that suggest that actually collagen itself can contain toxins that can build up in your bones. And it just feels like the whole collagen thing's becoming confusing now, whereas it felt straightforward before. I'm curious what you, where your research has led you. Yeah. You know, I change my opinion all the time on this topic. I did a podcast episode on collagen. Um, I don't think the marine collagen is as bioavailable as the grass fed. I always recommend only grass fed collagen from, from cattle. Bovine. Yeah. Bovine sources. Um, you, it has to be grass fed. It has to be as clean as possible. I heard someone recently, I can't even remember where I heard it. Um, they found some sort of a toxin in collagen again and again, I'm sure we're getting it in all our foods. I do like collagen. The studies have been very good out there for helping to stimulate some collagen when it's taken with vitamin C. If you can find it with hyaluronic acid, that's even better. Mm -hmm. Um, I do agree 10 to 20 grams a couple times a day with vitamin C is the best way to take it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go crazy over it. A little bit is still going to help. I'm kind of, you know, I'm a stepwise type of person. You know, if I go and I have a lot of ice cream in the whole spectrum of a year, it doesn't make a difference. You know, it doesn't mm. open the door to eat that way every day, you know, and I still feel like I have collagen in my bulletproof coffee in the morning. I do like to do it that way. That way works for me. And, um, I take vitamin C with my other vitamins in the morning and that helps me as well. And, um, that works for me. Other people will have a drink in the afternoon with some collagen. It must be grass fed and the bovine right. sources are the best and 20 grams and also take it with vitamin C because you need that C in order to support collagen stimulation. And yeah. it doesn't count as a protein. It doesn't have all the necessary amino acids to count as protein. So if you're counting your protein, you don't want to count that as 20 grams of protein. No, you got to do that on top. And what about the, um, 
do you recommend a certain amount of protein? Are you somebody who's kind of advocates a higher protein diet? I do. I, everyone's really different. And yeah. there's some amazing functional medicine doctors out there nowadays. I have a friend in, uh, bless you, a friend in Florida who does genetic testing on what the best diet is for each person. I know I do well on higher protein, higher fat diets. And a lot of my acne patients are afraid of fats. And the important thing for them to realize is that the inflammatory fats, canola oil, soy oil, um, vegetable oils, those type of fats are going to cause more oil to come out of the face and more uh, clogging of the pores and congestion in the face. Whereas healthy fats like olive oil, avocado, um, those are going to be anti-inflammatory and help balance the oils in the face. Mm. So I am a big proponent of healthy oils. Um, I do like to have um, cold water fish, wild cold water fish and avocados pretty much every day. And, um, I do eat a lot of olives and I have nuts as well. I know nuts can be controversial with the omega sixes, but they work for me. So you have to always check in with yourself and see what works for you and slowly introduce things and try it out. Um, cashews don't, I find, yeah. um, I find that, um, omega-3 if i take like two to four grams daily and it, coupled with an evening primrose oil that just makes my skin just kind of really glow and then if i don't take it within about five days i'll notice the impact on my skin i see a really mm -hmm. big difference with that um yeah so omega-3 about cashew then oh that's the only nut that i can't tolerate oh, okay. so it's like everyone needs to because i think the lectins but everyone has to pay attention yes. to it omega-3s are the one supplement besides vitamin d that i recommend for everyone um because it is so beneficial in so many ways even for acne patients because it is anti-inflammatory mm. uh and you want to look for a high quality one that's distilled that doesn't have mercury in it right and yeah high qualities, everything. If someone complains about the burps, you know, and the fish burps, I have them put it in the freezer. And by the time it, you know, goes through, uh, goes through it, it, it's, it's, uh, defrosted basically. And, um, they won't have the fish burps anymore and take it with a meal as well. Um, but I usually recommend about two grams a day. And then if you have a procedure, you want to stop about 10 days before, because it does thin your blood and can make you yeah bleed a little bit, but it's wonderful. It's, it's great for eczema. It's great for acne. It's great for overall health. So yeah, I, I love it so much. I love it. Have you found anything just before you go actually touching on eczema? Have you found anything to eczema is a pain, isn't it? It's one of those things. And I think that it has a lot to do with the gut, but trying to get to the bottom of eczema can be quite difficult um, and triggers, you know, for some people, dairy seems to trigger. What have you found with eczema? My daughter, it's really strange because my daughter gets these flare ups and the doctor always says it's eczema and I'm never even sure that it is. It's almost like a little rash and we can get it under control. And I think it's dairy that is her trigger. Um, I really do. Or if she, you know, if we've, she's been with friends, she's had some sweets, sugar will trigger it. Uh, I don't know what you found with debt, with eczema um, and how people can really target it. Yeah, there's a couple things with eczema. So people who have eczema tend to have allergies, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, seasonal allergies or asthma or um, food allergies, because eczema is basically an allergy in the skin. It's an imbalance of the immune system in the skin. So I'll, I'll even recommend meditation sometimes in adults that are struggling with it because inflammation, we need to balance the cortisol. And um, so it's an allergy in the skin combined with a skin barrier dysfunction. So I go to, how are you bathing? So many of us use too much soap. So I often will tell people only use a gentle cleanser, um, under your arms, your groin and your feet. We really don't need soap everywhere. We don't need to be lathered mm. because every time we see that surfactant lathering in the skin, it's drawing out our natural moisture in the skin and causing micro cracks, which are compromising our skin barrier, causing um, trans epidermal water loss and dehydration of our skin and allowing allergens in the environment to become that more uh, irritable to our skin or irritating to our skin. So minimize soap use before I start throwing other chemicals at people. I say, let's take a step at what you're doing. So minimize soap use. And then as soon as you get out of the shower, I like people to use a ceramide rich moisturizer because we've found that ceramides can help um, rebuild that skin barrier. So 
Yeah, it's C-E-R-A-M-I-D-E. Um, so a ceramide rich moisturizer. And then uh, sometimes food is associated or not. It's a very controversial thing. And there's a lot of debate in the dermatological community, whether it's related or not. I do know that people who have, have eczema do have a lot of food allergies, whether or not it's causal is controversial. But if there is a food allergy, certainly eliminate it. That's common sense, right? Mm. <laughs> it's just logical. And then Grass, um, I noticed it's interesting what you're saying about the skin yeah. allergy. Like with my daughter, the biggest thing is if she just goes and sit and she does get hay fever. She is quite a topic in that way. She, but if she goes and sits on the grass, it'll just come up in a rash on the back of her leg. She definitely has an allergy to that. I, yeah, I have that too. And I, she may just have a, you know, a, a very strong histamine response, which I understand. I've been like that my whole life. And, um, for that, I love a supplement quercetin, which has yeah. gotten a lot of press this year because it helps with the immune system, but it, 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 uh, it's a histamine blocker. So it, it prevents histamine mm -hmm. release sort of like Benadryl or diphenhydramine would without the drowsiness or the increase in appetite. So, um, histamine decreases appetite. And when, when we give people Benadryl or diphenhydramine to help the calm, the hives or calm eczema, it can increase appetite, which doesn't sit well with many women, you know? So mm -hmm. I find with quercetin, it has a similar effect and I do 500 milligrams twice a day. And, um, you don't have, the problems with, uh, increasing appetite and you're getting so many benefits from the flavonoid, you know, because it's such a beneficial, uh, supplement to take overall. So, um, but it definitely helps with, uh, histamine reactions and, um, L histidine is a scoop of L histidine. It comes in a powder has been shown in some studies to help with eczema. The problem with L histidine is some people who have high histamine reactions is that can be a trigger for them. So I usually try everything else. And if it doesn't work, then I'll add the L-histidine later on. Um, because if I add too many things at once and it gets worse, I don't know what's helping and what's hurting. And then the third thing that has helped is hemp seed oil is very yeah. helpful. So yeah, I that's very that. helpful. And my, I get my daughter actually to shower with hemp seed oil and that seems better rather than using any soap. Yeah, I found that. I've also found sea buckthorn oil seems to have an I love that as well. Yeah. 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 I love it. I, I use it on skin and hair as well. I love seed buckthorn oil. Um, and then hemp seed oil orally can be done as well. Oh, or okay. Dribbling some hemp seeds on food is very helpful as well. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And, and psoriasis is different, isn't it? Because is that autoimmune psoriasis? It's not the same as eczema. It's also an imbalance of the immune system where mm -hmm. um, the immune system is there's a couple things going on with psoriasis. So the immune system is overreactive. Um, so you actually have a stronger immune system. You're less likely to get an infection with psoriasis. That's why a lot of the medicines we have kind of are immunosuppressant. They suppress the immune system with psoriasis, um, which I'm not always a fan of. Um, but psoriasis can be life-threatening if it's everywhere. So we do have to treat people carefully. Um, and, uh, the other thing with psoriasis, so if you have a normal patch of skin, that skin might take about 28 days to go from the bottom layer to the top layer. Whereas with psoriasis, it's piling up in seven days. That's why it looks so scaly and thick and white because the skin just keeps piling up as quickly as possible. Um, vitamin D helps quite a bit in both a topical ointment. We have it as calcitriol or calcipatriene and also orally. I have people do it. Sunlight helps psoriasis. Mm -hmm. We have light therapy and, you know, back hundreds of years ago, people would go to the dead sea and, you know, get the sunlight and have the salt water. And it was very healing, um, back then. So, you know, minerals and sunlight can certainly help. Um, you know, this is obviously not medical advice because everybody's so different and the diagnosis may or may not even be psoriasis. And, um, with psoriasis is more of a concerning condition for me um, and for all dermatologists because it's associated with more inflammation in the body. So these patients have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. They have a higher risk of developing lymphoma. Um, it tends to be, there's a correlation between worsening psoriasis and increasing weight. So having a healthy lifestyle and avoiding metabolic syndrome is very, very important in patients with psoriasis. That's really the number one place to go before we start suppressing their immune system from a medical mm. perspective.
That's such great advice, such great advice. You are such a fountain of knowledge. You've been so gracious with your time. I could literally chat to you all evening. It's just so fascinating. Who knew the skin could be? I don't think we've left anything uncovered, but Jen, um, if there's anything else you'd like to add before I've linked to where people can find you, um, is there anything you want to, to, anything else you want to share about the skin? It's just been amazing talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's really fun. There's so much more to cover because dermatology is really interesting to me. Um, yeah, it's basically, if there's something going on on your skin, it's not limited to the skin. Yeah. It's also going on inside your body because your skin is your largest organ. So I love the fact that, you know, people come to me because they're bothered about something in their skin and then I can help them with, you know, like, oh, are you having joint pain? Or are you having stomach problems? And, you know, we can, it's just a sign that something deeper is going on. And, um, you know, we, we, I like to treat the whole person. So I think, I think that, um, that's the main takeaway is just know your skin is not limited to your skin and what's going on deeper inside your body, um, is just re reflected on your skin. And then the only other thing I wanted to bring up with, um, like people who are going through a lot of weight loss, what happens is, is we store a lot of toxins in our fat. So it can be really discouraging when women are losing weight and then they start breaking out and having all these rashes. And what's happening is their body is purging toxins through their skin. So just mm. stick with it, ride it out, and then you're going to have glowing skin afterwards. Yeah. So your body, because it's an outlet, isn't it, through the skin, which is why sauna is so amazing because you're actually detoxifying. Yeah. And actually, it's interesting because with sauna, one thing I was reading is actually that when you come out, you, yes, of course, you need to go and shower straight away because you want to wash those toxins off. But actually, you're better off even before you get to the shower because you it can start to dry on you is actually just getting a towel and just rubbing that sweat off before you enter the shower. Um, just yeah, to try and eliminate any of yeah, get it off any of that reabsorption. Um, I don't, I don't like the sauna and I love exercise. So I tried to convince myself that sweating through exercise was just as good as sauna, but the studies have shown that it's really not sauna does have benefits for other things that aren't attained through exercise. Combination of both is always the best, right? Combination of both. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's been amazing talking to you. We didn't even get to sexual health and skin. I think we might have to do that another time. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely Maybe. my pleasure if you'd be happy sure. to do that it's been amazing where can people find you do you treat people remotely do you have any resources they can go to um yeah how can they find more about you <laughs> i i do telemedicine in the united states i'm licensed in 22 states now so i do telemedicine through dermatologist on call that's one way people can find me um and then my podcast which you've been on which everybody loves amazing and, yeah that's which is fun. the radiance revealed Thank you. And then Instagram, I'm not as active as I should be, but I'm on there. And, um, and then, um, my website, drjenhaley.com and, um, yeah, just DM me. I, I can't give medical advice, but I, I love this information. I love sharing good information and, um, I'm so grateful you had me. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic. I will link to all of that in the show notes. Um, and yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you. Thanks, Angela.